screen is perfect. Excellent. 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 All right. Well, today uh, we're talking uh, uh, landscape uh, success, and we're going to be talking about fruit trees for the backyard. Now, this is going to be a little different presentation today because we've uh, put in a lot of videos. And the volume on the videos are kind of a hit and miss, so you may have to participate by using your volume today, increase or decrease. I happen to have a really loud voice in project, um, whereas some of uh, our people are, are, are pretty uh, quiet. So I hope you get it all, and um, I hope it's uh, entertaining and informative for you. Right, we're going to start off with a little garden video. I wanted to give you an opportunity to take a look at what a mature orchard might look like in your backyard. This is a Tennessee pear. Uh, over here, we have a small pawpaw tree. This is a Senseki pear. And this is a uh, plum. This beauty is a uh, bloom sweet grapefruit tree. You can see that I keep it at a reasonable height by pruning, but it does get very wide. So you're going to need to give uh, room to your grapefruit trees. This is a ruby red grapefruit. And you can see that it is smaller because, it, again, it's on Flying Dragon. And this gives you a smaller tree, but tons of fruit. This is an uh, Awari uh, Satsuma, delicious Satsuma. It grows in a weeping form, so I do give it some support. And that's just a natural growth pattern. On this side, we have several uh, fig trees. And you can see they're ready for the fall crop. We have several fig trees here. This is another citrus, the Ujukitsu. Uh, the Ujukitsu is a cross kind of between a uh, lemon and an orange. It is called the lemonade plant. Uh, these fruit I really appreciate because they're not even ready to eat until December or January. So uh, very good. Great cold hardiness, and um, they're a, a good addition to your orchard. Hi, I'm Deborah Burge, Forpin County Master Gardener, and I'm here with another Master Gardener, Angela. Hi. And Angela, you have created an oasis in your backyard. Can you tell us a little about it? Well, this first started as a uh, blank canvas. It's all alone, and uh, I was tired of maintaining it. And I thought, you know what? If I'm going to put in the work, why don't I have something to enjoy after I finish the work? And so I decided to grow fruit trees and other plants to enjoy. Great. Well, let's take a look at a few of your trees. OK. Are you ready? Sure. Angela, I love the raised beds, and it really lends itself to a very neat uh, garden plan. And I see here you have a trio of uh, fruit trees. What are they? So this one is a plum cot, and the one in the middle is a nectarine, and the first one here is a plum. They're all in the same family, so I thought put them together, and uh, they will have similar requirements and uh, can cross-pollinate and have higher fruit production. Excellent. And I say you've done the same thing with your citrus. You have another bed yes. of citrus plants. Yes. The first one is a Maya lemon, and the second one is a Kitsu mandarin. Um, they're smaller, and uh, they are easier to maintain. Excellent. And what was your uh, first fruit tree that you planted? What did you start with? So it was a page mandarin over there. It actually succumbed to weather after two years. and. Uh, I got them because they were on sale at Home Depot, and I just dug a hole and plopped them in without learning too much about it. All right. Well, let's <laughs> take a look through your, the rest of your garden. All right. All right. Angela, I love the beds. Can you tell us a bit about them? Well, so with the Houston weather, I figure it's really difficult to have the wood type of uh, raised bed and uh, other materials like what you see earlier with that composite material also don't last very well. They bow and they crack. Um, so I decided to just do the heavy lifting first and I use the cinder blocks and they are actually more stable, um, uh, last forever. Mm -hmm. And uh, that so far proved to be the right decision. Uh, in terms of the soil, uh, just uh, started with compost material, uh, keep on adding more. 
mulch and the mulch decomposes. I okay, Lucy, thank you very much. Well to it, but appreciate everything you do. Kill the turn things over and just keep on replenishing it. And I see you use straw in many places. What do you think the benefit of straw is over uh, hardwood? So straw is a lighter material uh, for fatigue me. It's easier to work with. And also if I change my mind or need to add some more, I could move things around if I really need to. Um, also, it doesn't really have uh, a lot of weeds themselves. There are some seeds that pop up, but it's easy to just pull them off. And uh, it, when it decomposes, it doesn't rub the soil of much nitrogen since it sits on top and it's a lighter, drier material. Well, Angela, I want to thank you for inviting us to your garden today. It's been an absolute delight. It's a beautiful place. You. If you had one bit of advice for newcomers, what would that be? Uh, there were, I would say to just get started uh, playing something. Playing something you like that you will enjoy experimenting with it. The joy of gardening is that it changes all the time. If you change your mind, I change my mind. We can pick up the plant and put it somewhere else or we plant something we don't like, we all can buy and replace it and put something else in the garden. It is incredibly joyful to see the garden grow and blossom uh, and as you learn and I uh, grow knowledge with it. Absolutely. And that's part of gardening is just learning. Yes. Thank you, Angela. My Okay, so we're going to talk a bit about uh, fruit trees. We're going to talk about uh, low maintenance uh, fruit trees that anyone can grow in their backyard. And um, the first one we're going to start with would be grapes. And I might say that um, the extremes we had in those past two videos, uh, that's about the, the most extreme. The rest of them are, are sort of in the middle of that. So, grapevines. All right, Boone, let's talk about uh, grapes. Probably one of the easiest plants that you can grow in your yard. Um, the grapes are uh, pruned back severely in the spring, and you only have a few canes coming off of the main vine. And then after that, it just grows. You barely have to uh, do any maintenance whatsoever you'll get a number of um, grapes from it and you'll harvest around July. I think I harvest mine in June this year. After that, you just let the vines grow and uh, they're just at the end of their life now and they'll begin uh, going into dormancy very soon. But uh, I would say one of the, the easiest fruits to grow and to start your garden with. I think folks looking at this, you got some leaf skeletonizers, a little, mm -hmm. a little leaf rust, some leaf mm -hmm. spot. Mm -hmm. um, all those leaves are going to drop. Um, be cognizant of uh, debris and mm -hmm. keeping that litter off for the growing season in the spring. Exactly. So what will happen is uh, the spring when we come in and clean up, I'll take off all the old canes and I'll uh, blow the bed clean take out a, the old mulch, mulch, and then I'll put in new mulch. And that'll start us off uh, pretty much fungicide free. Folks are gonna, uh, that are new to it, may be tempted to put a fungicide on this plant this time of year. What do you say about that? Absolutely not. The damage you're seeing started in the spring. Uh, yes. You put uh, it on now, I you're, saw them today. you're wasting your money, number one. And uh, you, you can damage your plant. Just a minute, I had just started watching this. Um, so just wait. Uh, this meeting. On its, Let me see if I can. All the leaves. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Can you pause, Debbie? Uh, rust on yes. them. And I'm so sorry. I'm going to, I am working to try to get everyone muted. I apologize uh, for the interruption. Uh, if the person who was speaking just now, could they please mute themselves? I'm having trouble finding you on the list. I think she's muted now. Okay, I'm sorry about that. Thank you. Okay, so let me, um, okay, pick up again. All right, we were talking about low maintenance uh, trees and plants that you can grow in your garden, and that would be grape, fig, pear, persimmon, blackberry, 
And uh, tropical trees can also be very easy to grow. And the easiest are banana, papaya, passion vine, and guava. Um, there, with a precaution that the tropicals must have cold protection. But other than that, on this list, these uh, plants all have very little maintenance uh, to contend with. So we were talking about the grape. I'll see if I can just move on from that. Um, grapes, uh, probably the most maintenance you'll do will be pruning them in the spring. And you can see there are a variety of ways to do that. You can uh, just put them over an arbor. You can hang them on a, on a uh, fence. You can make a trellis for them. But it's, uh, and they can be pruned in a variety of ways also. It doesn't have to be like you see in vineyards. You can even uh, bring up a, a single trunk and then have the, the canes cascading off from that. So you can be very creative with your uh, grapes. So now we'll talk about fig trees. The favorite trees, uh, I think, in, in my landscape would be the fig tree. Fig trees have a beautiful uh, appearance. They have a lot of landscape um, benefit, but they also produce a wonderful fruit. Now, these are uh, common figs that I have in my garden. Most of them are closed eye. Uh, and figs fruit on new growth. Now, this tree froze to the ground in December. So all of this growth that you see is from uh, this year and it's loaded with fruit you can see all the fruit on here and it should be ready soon this variety is a banana fig and it gets quite large delicious how do you like figs a lot i like them a lot and i'm looking at this one here and i think with that new growth typically on a on an older established plant We'd be seeing a lot more fig rust on these on this foliage, mm -hmm. but when it's allowed to be cut back and shoot out with some fresh vigor, mm -hmm. you don't see much on there at all. That's a good thing. Yeah, it is a good thing, and it's a good tree. Uh, I try to keep them. Um, that this is one of the tallest figs that that grow. I try to keep them a little shorter by uh, pruning half of them down every year to the ground and letting it come up, and then next year pruning the other half down. This is a good example of another fruit tree. This is um, Alma, and you can see she has a different way of fruiting. The banana tree will fruit all along the stem. This one will fruit in clusters. And uh, it, it also is a, a wonderful tree. Okay, so figs uh, commonly grow as multi-trunked plants. If you're down in the valley, you might grow it as a single trunk, but it's a lot of um, extra work to grow it as a single trunk here. And then during the uh, freeze, a hard freeze, it'll die back to the ground. So you have to start again. So multi-trunked uh, plants are the way to go. Um, also remember that um, they do bear fruit on a new growth and uh, often they'll have two fruitings, one in the spring, and then one in the fall. The, of course, the big disease is fig rust, and you're just not going to get away from it. When you live in our area with our high humidity, you're going to have fig rust. Um, it's most severe in very rainy uh, seasons. The, you first see it on the back of the leaf, and then it spreads to the top of the leaf. What it really, the worst thing it does is it causes a tree to defoliate and that can uh, cause it to be uh, weakened and uh, sometimes will drop its fruit. To control it, as I said in the video, keep your floor clean, keep all of the figs away. And remember that there's no fungicide that is labeled for control of fig rust. So now let's talk a little bit about pears, another plant that's very low maintenance. Boone, this is a, a beautiful pear tree uh, and pear trees are also very easy to grow in your garden. Um, they don't need a lot of maintenance. 
Uh, you do have to be worried about uh, fire blight, so make sure when you select a pair that you make sure it is resistant to fire blight. Fire blight is a disease that we have year round in our area because of our humidity and our winds and our wetness. Um, but this is a beautiful uh, pair. It is a hybrid between a European and an Asian. It has a nice russeted color on uh, the pear, but it's shaped like a European pear. And it's really good. It has a crisp, um, sharp taste to it. And uh, it's, it's a good tree. It's also a smaller tree and does not uh, overpower. This is about as high as it's going to get. Deborah, what would you say the top three considerations are on keeping this tree producing? Well, one of the top three considerations for these trees uh, to keep producing is uh, you're going to have to prune them from time to time. They do um, bear on uh, second year wood, so keep them pruned down. Don't feed them too much. If you give them too much fertilizer, you'll get nothing but leaf and growth, and that's not what you want. You want fruit growth. You also need to um, make sure you keep it open. Uh, being open is, is really important. Air circulation will take care of a lot of the problems you have with uh, disease. Consistent watering and um, just try not to worry about it too much. The pear will generally take care of itself. Now we'll talk about persimmon and I want you to look at the fall color on this persimmon tree. That's one of the beauties of the tree. It's, it's small, uh, the fruit is delicious, and the fall foliage is just uh, breathtaking. Um, Boone, this is a Suyu persimmon, and I will tell you the persimmon is probably one of my favorite fruit trees. Not only uh, do they give you wonderful fruit, but they also have um, a very nice shape to them and in the fall, they have gorgeous color. The leaves turn gold and purple and red. It's really a, a beautiful tree. It also stays small. It doesn't get very big. And so it's manageable. This tree doesn't really need any pruning whatsoever. Mm -hmm. It kind of forms a good small dense shape on its own. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Probably every once in a while, maybe take a, a, a wild branch if it's if it's wanting to shoot off in a crazy direction, but all in all, it looks like you haven't had to really do any pruning to this one. No, this has been a very nice tree for me. And you know, the interesting thing, this is a Fuyu, so it's a non-astringent. Uh, once we start getting into November and this, this uh, fruit will begin to color, you can actually eat it like an apple. It's crispy, it has the persimmon taste to it, and it's delicious. I have to cover them if I want them to stay on the tree until they become very soft because birds, uh, squirrels, you name it, everybody loves a persimmon. But if you let it soften up where it's like a custard, it is absolutely delicious to eat. Well, I think the one common complaint with uh, persimmons is even when they, when they do start to change color, they're very attractive to squirrels and, and birds and, and raccoons. And, anybody else that wants to eat it besides you. So any strategies that you have maybe to, to try to sideline those varmin before you get a chance to harvest? Yeah, the most success I've had is with organza bags and you can get them uh, mail order, uh, their wedding supplies, but they're just organza bags and I can tie it up. It doesn't stop the squirrels completely. It just aggravates them. And so they'll go and eat something else that's more convenient but it does keep the birds out of it. And, um, it, and so they work well for me. You don't really have to worry about pests because this tree is relatively pest free. Uh, it's just those four legged and two legged pests you need to worry about. And now we'll talk a bit about uh, bananas. Now, are there any questions so far? Hi, Deborah. There were a few questions. Okay. Um, let me go back. 
Someone had asked what variety the pear was. I saw that pop up and that was a kefir pear. Okay. One question was a, um, a Pakistani mulberry. Will you be talking about that? I will not. Okay, let me find that question. Um, I will say that a, a Pakistani uh, mulberry, mulberry trees are really easy to grow. Um, the fruit is uh, tasty. It's um, not too sweet, no tartness at all. It's, it, in fact, it's very sweet, um, juicy. Um, they can, some varieties can be very staining. A lot of people grow them for wildlife because the birds absolutely love them. So uh, it's a good, um, it's a good tree. It's a big tree. So, so the question was, they planted it back in 2016, uh -huh. grew to a height of approximately 15 feet, mm. it never fruited. It put on what looks like flowers each year, but the flowers didn't turn into fruit. And then the great freeze of February 2021 took a toll on it, and there's plenty of evidence of damaged dead limbs. Um, he's planning on cutting it down and replacing it with something else. He was curious why this tree never fruited. Does it require a mate for fertilization? Um, well, uh, not, not actually, no. So I'm not sure um, exactly what the, what the problem might be. Um, mulberries tend to be kind of um, both. They, they, they have uh, both of the, the, um, both of the, um, flowers on it, male and female. So they're, they're self fruitful. He shouldn't have had a problem with that. Why it only bloomed and did not fruit. Uh, I couldn't tell you. I don't know what the problem would be on that. Uh, unless it was just not getting enough sunlight, uh, because all, uh, fruit trees need sunlight. Uh, but don't really know. Okay, another question was you had talked about a fruit that ripened in November, December. It was when you were showing Angela yes. Chance. It's an Ujukitsu. Oh, okay. Not the Awari? No, no. That, well, no, the uh, Satsumas, some of them do uh, ripen very late in season. So, uh, you know, depending on how you want to do it, you can uh, have Satsumas from September through December just by getting a number of varieties. But the Ujukitsu, the uh, blood oranges, and that's all I can think of offhand, uh, they're not ripe until uh, January or February. And so they're a very late fruit and they're delicious. Any other questions? Okay, they have a persimmon tree that produces several fruits every year. They never get mature and just fall off. What do you recommend? Okay, now tell me what the fruit is again. I'm getting some um, um, persimmons. Oh yes, the persimmons, and they do what they they fruit. Fall. The fruit fall off. Yes. Okay. Uh, and they fall off. I'm assuming that they're, um, I'm, I'm assuming that they're uh, green when they fall off. Is that what they said? No, they just said they, they fall off. They fall off. Okay. Um, well, I can't tell you why that might be unless the most common reason is because you're not uh, keeping the soil moisture consistent. Uh, Any time a tree puts on fruit, its requirement for water is going to increase because now it has to enable that fruit to fill out. So I would say um, watch your, your water moisture. That needs to be kept at a very, um, uh, a very um, consistent level. Okay, let's see. 
All right. Any uh, let's why don't we proceed and then we can uh, go over any other questions sure. at another time. Can, All right. Can so we interrupt you anytime and ask a question. Uh, yes. Well, you know what? Wait till I get much. not in the middle of a video, but wait until I get to the end of the video and then you can ask okay. me a question if um, it's pertinent to that part of it. Uh, All right, well, so we're going this to is regarding the satsuma that you had mentioned. Because yes. we have satsuma oranges. Yes. During the freeze, our our two satsumas thought we di it died. They died, so we cut them up to a foot, you know, above ground. Um, we are seeing sprouts around that, you know, that did dead trunk that we thought was dead. So yes. there's. Some um, Rosalinda, most I, I, I'm guessing that's you, Rosalinda. What you are seeing. Uh, most likely is rootstock. So your citrus are always grafted, or the majority of them are grafted to rootstock. And uh, when your scion, the part of the tree that you purchased, uh, dies off, your rootstock will put out new leaves. And most likely, um, you will look closely, and the leaves look a bit different than your the leaves on your tree. They're probably um, in a, 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 a three-leafed cluster, and that's a trifoliata. Um, so most likely it is a rootstock. So look for the, your graft line. Anything below that graft line is rootstock, and it will not give you the fruit you want. It will have very, very sour and uh, seedy fruit. So now we will go on with banana trees. So banana trees are a tropical tree, but they are so much fun to grow in. Very, very low maintenance. When you're planning uh, to grow fruit trees in your yard, you might want to consider tropical plants. And one of the easiest of the tropical plants is the banana tree. Um, they produce wonderful flavored fruit and each variety will have a different tasting fruit, which is great. I have one variety, the uh, Orinoco, that has a citrus taste to it. This is a blue java, also called ice cream. It doesn't taste like ice cream, but the uh, texture is very smooth like ice cream. Now, banana trees are not trees at all. They're herbaceous plants. They will continue to grow from a small pup, which this one is, and it grows from the center. You can actually see the new leaf right here in the middle of this leaf, and it's about ready to come out. So these plants will keep growing. It will take them 15 to 18 months of continuous growth, and that's like a 50 degrees, uh, 50 degree mean temperature for them to produce fruit. And you can generally do that every two years in our area. So this plant will produce not this year, of course, but next year it should produce fruit. Deborah, I'm sure back here we look at this grove of bananas, probably start off as just a couple of corn. What would you have to say about the invasiveness and these things maybe moving out of the area that you originally intended them for? Actually, they're pretty easy to keep up with. If you're going to plant them along a fence line, I would advise you put a barrier, and that just means digging down uh, about a foot or so and put some barrier cloth in it. Or one of the easiest ways to do it is to build a trench, put some uh, rocks in there, and then you can just easily pull them out when they pop up. It's also easy to remove pups when they're coming up. Um, this is a good example here. Here is a pup that has uh, come up and I would simply take a shovel and just put it between those two uh, pseudo, stem, pseudo stems and I would press down and that pup would come out. I grow mine in a clump because uh, it helps protect each one of the plants from wind damage and wind is one of the most damaging factors uh, to banana trees. You, they like a, a consistent soil. They're not heavy feeders. They produce readily. Uh, I just love them, and they're beautiful. Yeah, very tropical feel to the landscape. 
Yes. Uh, what about leaves? Do you do anything with the leaves? I do not do anything with the leaves, but a lot of people do. Uh, and that depends on the variety. Apparently, some of the leaves taste a whole lot better than other leaves to bake with. But um, I, don't, I don't do that. I just wait for the bananas to come around. You mean we're not going to cook a pig this evening? No pigs tonight. <laughs> All right, banana trees. Uh, they are a perennial herb. The pod that comes uh, to have your bananas is actually the 135th leaf from the very beginning. It takes 15 to 18 months of uninterrupted growth to bloom. And remember that um, the banana trees will stop growing at about 57 degrees. It takes two to three months for the bananas to fill out after uh, they have formed. And then you wanna remove the tree after harvest because it will no longer uh, bear uh, any bananas and will begin to die. Banana trees like rich fertile soils, uh, you can use lots of mulch and organic matter in slow release nitrin, nitrogen. Uh, they like steady warmth, uh, not too hot, not too cold. They like steady moisture in the ground. Uh, they like the shelter of other bananas. Wind is really very damaging to um, banana trees and, and will disrupt their uh, photosynthesis. You want to insulate the pseudo stem for cold protection. Uh, I haven't had to protect mine in a very long time because our winters are becoming warmer. Another uh, easy, low maintenance uh, tropical is passion fruit. This is also an extremely easy tropical plant to grow. This is a passion vine. Um, now, there are a lot of passion vines out there, but the one that you can eat is a Passiflora edulis. Now, there are a number of others that are just ornamental. They will put on a, a fruit, but it um, is awful. So don't go there. This is a delicious fruit. Um, it grows fairly uh, fast. This froze all the way to the ground in February, and now just a few months later it is growing it will eventually go all the way across the trellis where it was last year uh, it blooms the blooms are pretty but they're somewhat inconspicuous but the fruit then forms it's a large fruit about the size of a tennis ball and it's green to start with and then will slowly turn a, a shriveled up kind of a purple and it's delicious on the inside we really uh, enjoy eating them it's a unique flavor that um, is difficult to describe. You just cut it in half and eat it fresh. I cut it half and spoon it out, and it is absolutely delicious. You can also make a curd with it. You can make uh, an ice cream out of it. It's really quite delightful. It has a tiny bit of a um, grapefruit flavor to it. Cool. Yeah, yeah, but they're nice. Now, this one has a yellow tint to it for one interesting reason I bet yours do too this is grown in a pot and uh, we have had about eight weeks of constant rain when you have a great deal of rain that water is constantly washing through the soil and it will wash all the fertilizer out of it so I need to feed this and uh, get some nitrogen to it because it has chlorosis now this thing's got tendrils and it grows like crazy it After does. winter die back, um, how far do you want to clean this thing up? How far can you take it back if you need to? I usually take it back to about a foot off the ground. And that's a good point when it comes uh, to um, winter care or protection. You can cut it back and then throw blankets over it, all sorts of things, and then the roots are, are fine. All right, passion fruit vines. Um, the passion fruit that you want to get is Passiflora edulis. Um, they come from the highlands and they like a highland climate. They like cool winters, nothing below 41 degrees. Uh, they like warm summers and uh, prefer uh, that their summer gets no hotter than 75, 
uh, but they still perform pretty well during our uh, 90 degree weather. The yellow passion fruit is more tropical and a little more difficult to grow than the purple one. They prefer 30 to 47 inches of rain a year, and we get about 50, so we match up fairly well there. However, they do set fruit poorly during rainy season. Uh, they also have a poor tolerance to wind and they require a trellis. They like their soil between 6.5 and 7, which is good because most of Fort Bend County soil ranges from 7 to 8. And they like a very well drained uh, soil. And it takes about 8 to 12 weeks, depending on the variety, for the fruit to ripen. Now we're going to discuss some of the medium maintenance fruits. Um, and these fruits, again, uh, are considered medium maintenance because they have requirements for soil or perhaps for uh, protection. We're going to start with the blueberry. So um, blueberries are actually uh, very easy to grow if you know how to grow them. Um, and they require a couple of things. Number one, they need a very acidic soil. They need a pH of about 5 to 5.5. Our pHs run more from 7 uh, to 8. And so if you plan to put them into the ground, just plan to say goodbye to them pretty quickly. Now, these uh, blueberries that I'm growing are southern high bush. They're the big blueberry fruit. And I enjoy the, the southern high bush and have had more success with them because they have lower uh, chill hours. Their requirements are only 150 up to 350. Whereas many of the uh, rabbit eye blueberries that uh, you see for sale can be up to 500, 600, 900 chill hours. We're just not going to get that except when we have a, a huge freeze like uh, this past February. Now, one of the requirements is soil because the pH requirement is very low. It has to be 5 to 5.5. So there is a mix that you can grow in your container and the mix is to use one third peat, one third pine, uh, shredded pine bark and uh, one third perlite. That makes a great mix, but there is a caution. And that caution is that uh, peat and the shredded pine tend to uh, shed water if you let it dry out too much. And so you can come in and water and, and the water's just gonna run right through and it's not gonna nourish your plant. So make sure you always do consistent watering. And when you water, use rain water because if you use your uh, water from the faucet, that's a very alkaline water and it's going to then make your soil more alkaline. So rainwater, a nice mix of peat, perlite, and shredded uh, pine, and uh, you can have beautiful blueberries. What do you think, Boone? You Poll want a one? Pollinizer. Pollinizers. Uh, yes, you do have different varieties, so you're going to need uh, at least one of two different varieties. Uh, there is a southern high bush that's self-fertilizing, and there is a rabbit eye, uh, the lemonade, that is self-fertilizing, but you're going to get a better production if you have two plants of different varieties. All right, that mix we talked about for blueberries is one-third shredded pine bark, one-third perlite, and one-third peat. You also need to add in a very good time release uh, fertilizer and uh, make sure that you uh, keep that going. Uh, you do want to put them in, of course, a raised bed or a container. Any questions on uh, blueberries? Deborah, one of the questions we got, which you just answered is, can you build raised beds for blueberries and will it work? Yes, 
Uh, if you're just going to build a raised uh, bed, make sure it's at least 12 inches high. Blueberry roots tend to be quite shallow, and so they're not going to dig down into the um, the soil, your alkaline soil. Um, but the other way you can avoid that is just to put a bottom on that um, on that raised bed, or put them in a container. The next question is: Can we use pine needles instead of pine bark for blueberries? No. Uh, the the good thing about your pine bark in um, is that it's going to uh, decompose. So it will decompose, whereas your pine needles never decompose. Therefore, they add nothing to uh, no nutrients to uh, your soil mix. So do use the pine bark. And we're going to move on now to avocados. Unfortunately, um, they're pretty expensive and they get them home, they put them in the ground, and before you know it, that avocado has become a shriveled up mess. Several reasons for that. Uh, one of them would be the root system. They really need to be on a berm, they need to be raised, or you can grow them in a container. The other reason is because of this green wood, you can see it all up and down, that's green wood. That wood will sunburn and then you'll get a canker in that area and it will shut down any of the, um, the um, vascular system that's in that area. What you're wanting to do with your avocado is to grow it as an understory tree until it puts on bark. Now you can see the bark here. See how brown it is? And you can see the bark. Let's see if I can get this off. You can see the bark here on the grafted part. The bark has started to grow, but it's still not completely covered with bark. So I will still give this a lot of protection by shade during the day. So it's going to get morning sun, but it does not get afternoon sun. And that's important. Um, this tree did suffer from the freeze. So uh, it's a little gangly right now. But we're just going to let it grow and we'll feed it in the spring and, and uh, get it to um, a, a stronger place next year. So pollinating? Yes. Now, I know you've all heard a lot about you need an A and a B and all of that. Not really. Um, we have a lot of things going for us in this part of Texas and one of them is our crazy weather. So in places like California, where the weather is consistently the same, you're going to have blooms that open as female, they close uh, when the temperature goes down, and then when the temperature rises a bit, they will open up as male. Fortunately, our weather is rather chaotic, and um, we have low temperatures at night and higher temperatures during the day. So these flowers, instead of being synchronized clockwise, they're unsynchronized and they will open and close, open and close uh, the entire blooming season. So they are self-fertile in our area. And that's a good thing. All right, avocados need protection for the first two to three years of their life and just grow them as an understory plant. Trunks and stems are very susceptible to sunburn and they are not cold hardy until they are mature. And mature is anything over five years old. And uh, after that, they can be cold hardy down into the 20s. So citrus. I don't have a video for citrus, but we'll talk about it very quickly. Uh, there are numerous, numerous varieties of citrus and citrus is uh, a wonderful uh, plant to grow. It gives you terrific fruit. Uh, it has various uh, varying um, amounts of cold hardiness. Now, um, there are two factors that will determine if you're a uh, fruit tree is going to survive a freeze. And that is basically, is it acclimated or unacclimated? 
And so an acclimated tree would be one where we've had gradual cooler and cooler days um, until, uh, you know, that first frost or freeze comes in. Unacclimated is when we're, you know, knocking it out at 85 and 90 degrees and then suddenly uh, everything uh, plummets and we have a huge frost or a freeze. The trees that um, are acclimated, the ones that are uh, better uh, are getting cooler and cooler by the day, they're going to have a much better chance of survival than the ones that are actively growing and then are suddenly hit with a frost. As you can see, those temperatures vary depending on the variety of plant that you're uh, growing. The kumquat uh, tends to be the most cold hardy with uh, the Satsuma mandarins right behind that. Um, lemons and limes, or true lemons and limes, are your uh, least cold hardy. But remember that a Meyer lemon is not a true lemon, and therefore they are more cold hardy than, say, your uh, Lisbon lemon or your uh, Persian lime. All right, are there any questions about those medium maintenance trees? Nancy? Sorry, I muted myself by accident. <laughs> so we had some avocado questions, or do you just want to do citrus? No, no, avocado is fine. Anything that was in that that section will work. Okay. We have an avocado seed that got its roots two weeks ago. How much longer should we keep it growing until we can put it in a pot? Uh, well, you can put it in a pot pretty quickly. You, you, in fact, you can even just pot that seed uh, and, and root it in, in, uh, in the soil. So you can put it in quickly. Um, get to know that plant because it's going to be a long time before it, it bears fruit for you. It can be up to uh, anywhere from 10 to 17 years, depending on the variety. Um, Mary Wu asks, what pot size should be used? This is someone different, and I think it has to do with avocados when you're potting them. Okay. Um, you want to use the largest pot that you can maneuver, because when it comes to the avocado, um, the citrus, um, any of those types of uh, trees that need cold protection, you have to be able to take them in to a greenhouse or to a warm garage or somewhere like that. So the largest pot that you can carry or, or maneuver is what you need. Okay. Are kumquats usually grafted? My dead tree has new growth from the bottom of the stem, but it looks like the original leaves. Uh, yes, kumquats uh, generally are uh, grafted. Okay. Oftentimes, our, uh, especially if we've had the tree for quite a while, our uh, graft line will seem to disappear because uh, the mulch level, the debris, the things breaking down just seems to get higher and higher on our truck. And so, it, it can appear that you have growth coming from below the graph line when the reality is that it is above the graph line. It's just that your graph line is now almost uh, with soil level. So uh, you can go and just dig down and dig down on that trunk until you can t uh, uh, try to tell if it is above the graph line or not. Are thornless lime trees hardy in this zone? No, uh, actually, they are, they're not. I mean, they, they grow quite well as a container uh, tree. I've had one for over 20 years in a container, and it produces like crazy. Um, but if you put them in the ground, um, you can plan on probably replacing it every five years. So my citrus plant has lots of flowers, then small, tiny fruit, which then dry up and fall. Yes. <laughs> um, yes. What normally happens, uh, and it would depend on, there is an exception to every single rule. 
And uh, one of those exceptions is that um, citrus trees are self-fertile. They are male and female, uh, except for clementines. And clementines, they, no, tangerines. Tangerines need to be pollinized. And if they are not pollinized by another citrus, then they will drop their fruit um, pretty quickly. Now, another thing that happens to citrus is that citrus puts on too much fruit uh, for it to handle. They all do that. And you will see uh, the tiny fruit, maybe the size of a, a green pea, will be dropped. They'll drop 75% of their first crop. And then it grows. And then when it gets up about the size of a quarter, it will drop again. And it drops fruit that it, that it cannot maintain. One of the reasons that fruit trees drop, or one of the most common reasons fruit tree drops fruit is because we don't pay attention to the water. As I said before, they have moisture requirements that increase when it comes to putting on fruit because they have to, to feed that fruit a lot of sugar. So, if it's not a tangerine, then your the answer to your problem would be that it's not getting appropriate watering. Could also be too much water, but it's inappropriate water, either not enough or too much. So just monitor that. What percentage of avocados survived winter storm Yuri outdoors? There are no statistics on that. I've not read a thing. Most uh, of the publications are concerned with uh, oak trees and uh, arborvitae and uh, all of that, uh, landscape trees. Most fruit trees, uh, the uh, most fruit trees survived. The ones that did not survive were the ones that were still actively growing. If you'll remember, we had a very, very mild winter last year until Yuri hit us. And so all of our trees were still in the process of um, the uh, carbohydrates and sugars going up and down the vascular system. They were still putting on uh, new leaves. So it was a very hard hit. Avocado trees can take very low temperatures. And depending on where they are uh, located, they can uh, survive quite nicely. So there's no real statistics on avocados and in who survived and who didn't survive in the back in the backyard. But um, you know, they have the same chances as citrus has when it comes to uh, surviving uh, sudden cold weather. So on that same vein, when the avocado tree is less than five years old, how cold of a temperature can it withstand before you should bring it in? If it's younger than five years old, you should just bring it in. Just bring it in. And then when it gets beyond five, you know, I would be pretty careful if I'm going to get down into the high 20s, I would either wrap it quite well, wrap the trunk, or I would bring it in. Um, it's just um, not worth putting a lot of effort and time into growing a tree if you're going to lose it because you just, you know, got tired of, of wagging a tree around. Now, if you want to plant it in your yard, plant it in a very uh, secure location, like against a south-facing wall or a hedge or uh, a group of uh, trees, you know, it, it give it protection from the north wind. In that way, when that freeze comes in, it won't be as harsh. It, you know, will be protected uh, and won't get as, as much damage. So, you know, you, you have to think about site selection. You have to think about, well, how willing am I to pull it in and out? What do I want to do about this tropical? Okay. I have two questions on citrus tree leaves. So my citrus tree leaves are starting to yellow. Can overwatering cause this? And another one is why citrus tree leaves curled? The tree is in a pot. 
So one okay. is as far as yellowing, um, there could be a yes, overwatering is a huge cause of uh, yellowing leaves. Ask yourself if the yellow leaves are at the bottom of the tree and moving up. Are they on only one branch over by itself? Um, there are just a lot of, of reasons um, for it to have yellow leaves. Send Hotmail, um, go to the website, um, www.fbmg and send us a, a picture and send us a, an email and we'll get back to you and, and, and let you know why your, your leaves are yellow. And then curling, there are three reasons why your leaves curl. One would be um, uh, sudden weather change, too hot, too cold. Another one would be uh, wrong watering, too much or too little. Another one can be um, insect or pest, could be the Asian citrus psyllid or it could be leaf miner. Again, I would need to see some photos to uh, make a diagnosis on that. So now we go, we will continue to high maintenance trees. Now these are trees that um, they are desirous, but uh, if you want to grow them, there's uh, you have to make the trade off there. It's high maintenance. You have to give them a lot of time and attention. And those trees are apple, peach, cherry, mango, and sugar apple. And the big problem with mango and sugar apple is that they are very sensitive to temperature change, both hot and cold. The most reliable apple in our area is the uh, Anna and the Golden Door set. Um, this is the Anna and she has a nice red blush, tends to be a um, very sweet apple. This is the Golden Door set. It's a little more yellow. It still will get a bit of a, a red blush on it. Also a delicious apple. And I think one of the fruit trees that most people are, are more interested in growing than any other would be the apple tree. Yeah, unfortunately, um, apples really don't do that well here. Even um, the most trusted like Anna, and Golden Dorset, they are the only ones that produce a, a, a good fruit, but they're high maintenance. Big time, big mm -hmm. time. We got a whole bunch of <clears throat> uh, bacterial leaf spot on here, looking mm -hmm. pretty bad. Mm -hmm. um, got some internal damage on here, some slime flux growing out of this mm -hmm. tree. So, And that's from freeze damage this past year. One of the things we know about this variety, and this variety is a sundowner. One thing we know about the, the, this tree is that it is a desert plant. It does not uh, tolerate freezes. So I do have a lot of damage on this one. And um, this one's gonna go elsewhere. It's not a productive tree. I do have an Anna and uh, a Dorset growing uh, to your side over here. They are productive, but uh, you have to be willing to spray your apple trees if you want a good crop because you're going to get insects and uh, that's all there is to it. You're going to have uh, leaf-footed bugs, stink bugs, you're going to have codling moths. There's just a lot of insects in our area that love apples. Probably the best thing that's going to become from this tree is maybe some, some barbecue wood, cook yes. some fish or some pork wood. <laughs> Soon I think one of the of the fruit trees that a new gardener may want to avoid and that would be a peach tree although there's nothing better than a homegrown peach uh, growing that peach can be an absolute nightmare um, you have to prune it and it has to be uh, pruned preferably twice a year you have to be very careful with the roots because um, they will get root rot in, in, almost immediately. They're, so it's very difficult. You want to um, build them up on a berm. You want to put them in a raised bed or I have this one in a, in a pot at this point. Uh, after they bloom and that is just beautiful and they put on fruit, then you have to worry about the plum curculio 
the stink bug. You have to worry about all of those pests that want to get that uh, peach. If you're going to grow peaches, you have to commit to a spraying regime. If you don't want to spray, if you uh, want to be completely organic, it is very difficult. Uh, it's, um, it's doable, but it takes a lot of man hour. What do you think? Well, unfortunately here in Southeast Texas with our rainfall, humidity, and, and this length of season as far as insect and disease pressure, uh, it's just not on our list of plants that we want to try to grow. And this one, how long have you had this one in here? Uh, this one's been here for about six months now. And you see, uh, you know, some sunburn on mm -hmm. here. Or already seeing some, some disease pressure on this young plant. And, and without just a whole lot of TLC, uh, this thing's going to be a lot more work uh, than we're going to actually end up seeing enough fruit that's going to make up a balance of how much stuff we have to put into this time and energy and just frustration. You're exactly right. Uh, you know, it rained all of uh, May and June, and this tree was uh, desperate, to, even though I'd planted it in a berm. So I dug it up and put it in here. All of those months of cloudy uh days and then suddenly in august it became or uh, mid july to august it became extremely hot and humid that's why you're going to see all of this right. the tree just wasn't prepared for it it wasn't hardened off one of the fruit trees all right peach trees peaches plums nectarines and apricots um the guidance from uh, Texas A&M is use sulfur fungicides throughout the spray program. Decrease the application interval to the shortest interval allowed. That's the time between the, the, the sprayings. Shortened intervals are important during the late bloom, shuck split, and first cover period, and again during the harvest, uh, pre-harvest period. So that's a, a, a lot of uh, a lot of spraying. Uh, this is a very beautiful multi grafted uh, peach tree, but you know, pretty is as pretty does. This tree has to be pruned. It must be sprayed. It's very susceptible to boars and bacterial canker and nematodes. Plum cuculeo. Um, we normally have them on citation rootstock, although if you're in a sandier soil, uh, you can use Nemagard or Lovell. Any questions about um, those trees, apples and, and peaches? Um, so can you recommend an insect spray that is good to use for the apple trees? Um, no, I don't, I don't use, um, I don't actually use insecticides at all. So, uh, I can give you a site to go to though, and I'll give that at the end of the presentation. So that was the only specific question about, um, apples or peaches. Okay. Well, we'll do this last video. And then uh, we will get into the specifics of the general questions that came up. All right, so now we're gonna talk about some fun tropicals that you can grow in this area. Well, let's talk about uh, some fun things you can grow. Uh, very, very low maintenance, and that would be the pineapple. Now, a uh, pineapple is simple to start with. Uh, you can just um, twist the top out of a pineapple that you've purchased. You peel off some of the lower leaves and then you put it in the soil. That's about the extent of it. And then it begins to grow. And the investment is really great because your mother plant will continue to give you plants again and again and again. So what do I mean by, by mother plant? Well, here is a, a pineapple growing. Now a pineapple is in the bromeliad family and uh, they bloom much like a bromeliad. A little flower is down in the center cup, and then it begins to grow. And 
Here it is. Now this will turn, uh, it'll about double in size and it will turn a beautiful golden color. And it is so delicious. You can't imagine the difference between a pineapple you buy in the store and a pineapple that you grow in your own. It melts in your mouth. So when this is ready, you just give it a twist or you cut it off. And then you keep your mother. Now she won't bear uh, another pineapple, but what she will do is she'll give you pups like this one. I harvested a pineapple from this one uh, about a month or so ago. I have two more plants here. I have another one growing in here. I have one here. Yeah, there's a lot. I twist them off and put them in another pot, such as this one. This is my old mother. And I've, I've kept her and I've kept count and she has given me 25 plants. So 25 pups. It's, uh, it's an easy plant. I like the look of it. You treat them basically like a uh, bromeliad, except that they like full sun. So you give them sun, you give them a little fertilizer and water, nothing to it. Now another easy plant to grow is a papaya. Now the papaya can be uh, frustrating, but it can also be a lot of fun. This papaya last year was about 10 feet tall, really tall, and uh, too big, in fact, for me to take in during the winter. So we were going to winter it through. And unfortunately, it did get freeze damage and kind of fell over on its side. And, and so here we are with this very short papaya, but you can see all of the fruit underneath. So it's loaded with fruit. Now the problem with a papaya fruit is it takes almost uh, six months for it to mature. So you want to make sure that you have fruit early in season so that it's uh, mature and ready to be pulled by the end of your season before winter comes. These will be ready in a couple of weeks. The larger ones are already beginning to put a little orange flush on them. Another tropical that's extremely easy to grow is the dragon fruit or the pitaya. Very easy to grow. You grow it just like a cactus, which is with benign neglect. But here's the one issue. You have to have a good support system for it. You wouldn't believe it by looking at it, but this thing weighs a ton. It's very heavy. No matter what type of support I give it, it just keeps pulling over. Now, I will be uh, moving this into the ground next year and building a, a nice support of two-by-fours in uh, wire. This is a bloom. Now, this is a, has just started. The bloom will actually become maybe twice this size. And when it opens, the flowers are gorgeous. They're uh, about the size of a dish. They're, uh, they look just like the... Uh, night blooming serious bloom, they're beautiful. So well worth having around if for no other reason than the blooms, but the fruit is delicious also. And this is what the, the bloom looks like. You can see it's uh, really large and quite beautiful. So a reminder that March 12th, 2022, we will be having another herb and vegetable sale. Um, now here's that uh, website I was going to tell you about. So this is the website, Aggie Horticulture, T-A-M-U.edu, Fruit Nut. When you uh, go to that website, you'll see a page like this. And each one of these names, like apples, avocado, you can click on that, and then a PDF will come up and we'll talk to you about um, how to grow the plant. And uh, it looks much like this and has all the information you need, and it's always written by um, the fruit specialist of AM. We have our fruit tree sale February the 12th, and they will it will be at the fairgrounds and it will be uh, in person. If you have any questions at all about your trees or your plants, this is uh, the email to send them to. 
Fort Bend MG at ag.tamu.edu. And we will be more than happy to help you with uh, your plants. Please send photos. We always appreciate those. And here are the two resources that I use today. Now, are there any other uh, questions? So there, there are lots of questions. Um, oh, okay. So when you were talking about pineapples, they asked, should you keep them in pots or can you plant them in the ground? And what size pots do you recommend for pineapples? Well, uh, honestly, pineapple roots are minimal. So you can probably see on that video, I had them in all sizes, uh, just whatever I can find, I put it in. Uh, I, I have been growing some in the ground. The problem with growing them in the ground is that you have to keep them continuously growing uh, for about a year and a half to two years. So you would have to be able to put some type of protection over them. Uh, the ones I had in the ground last year did survive Yuri, which is was amazing to me. Um, they were knocked way down and, and some of the um, original plants died, but they came up from the roots. So that was a good experiment. But um, yeah, I, I keep mine in a pot because it's just easier to bring them in and then I get fruiting from them much sooner. Okay. Um, how much time will pineapple take to fruit? It depends on uh, whether you propagate it from a crown or from a uh, sucker or from a uh, sprout. And uh, but the generally it's everything from a year to two years. What size pot do you recommend for the papaya? Papayas actually uh, can grow in fruit in a, a very small pot. Um, I had one, I have one right now that is in a five gallon pot and it is uh, about 10 feet tall. And I have to, to uh, tie it to a, a, a trellis because it keeps falling over. So they'll grow in anything. Seriously, they will. Um, but you do remember, you want a good balance between pot and soil and roots, because the smaller your pot, the more roots you have, the more difficult it is to keep adequate uh, watering and fertilizing for that tree. For dragon fruit, can you propagate it from cuttings or do you plant it from the seed? Cuttings are the best way to go on those. Uh, you can grow it from seed, but cuttings is so easy. Uh, way easy. You just cut it and lay it on the ground and it'll start callousing over and then it'll start putting out roots. So it's just no problem whatsoever. You yes. do need two different varieties in order to uh, have good fruit. They tend to be uh, self sterile. So your recommendations for citrus or fruit trees for dependable high volume production, and this is for a food pantry. My recommendation of fruit trees. Yeah. Okay. Citrus and fruit trees for dependable high volume production. Okay. Well, um, high value production. I would go definitely a Meyer lemon. I would definitely go with, uh, because Meyer lemons tend to be somewhat cold hardy and normally they're not grafted either. They put out a good quality uh, produce, and people uh, want them and enjoy them. And then we're and then we'll go to uh, a citrus. That's a, yeah, and then a satsuma. Satsumas are actually uh, have some good cold hardiness. It's a fruit that everyone likes to eat, and um, they're pretty dependable. And then I would go with a uh, pear tree because pear trees will put out a lot of fruit really good. I would probably get one that's more of a um, maybe a um, European type pear 
rather than an Asian pear because Asian pears tend to have a lot of uh, pest issues. Um, and then blackberries. Blackberries are so easy to grow, really prolific. Um, get the um, get the uh, thornless variety. Uh, the best tasting uh, blackberry out is the Kiowa, but it does have uh, thorns. And when you go to to do the maintenance on them and trim them trim them up, it can be pretty traumatic. Uh, but they have some good thornless varieties, so definitely blackberries are a way to go. Uh, grapes again. You you can get pounds and pounds of grapes for very little uh, input of um, labor. Plums are a so-so. Apples don't want to go that way. Peaches stay away from that. That's about that's about the size of it. That's what I would do. Oh, and figs. You got to do figs. Thank you, Boone. <laughs> Yes, definitely figs. Okay, any of them that you recommend for a pot? You can grow any fruit in a pot, and I have grown all of those things in a pot just to experiment. If you grow in a pot, you have to remember you're going to get less fruit and you will have to do more maintenance. Uh, so that's a trade-off, but you can grow anything in a pot. Uh, and in growing in a pot is good for someone that maybe is um, thinking they might be moving within the next year or so, and they don't want to, you know, they want to keep their tree so they can take it with them. So that would be a good reason to do a pot. Uh, another one would be if you just have uh, way too much shade and you have to move your plant around um, as the uh, sun changes in order to, to give it adequate uh, sun, that might be a reason. There are a lot of reasons, but um, yeah, a lot of reasons to do it, but uh, really soil is best. So then some questions about fertilizers. When do you recommend fertilizing fruit trees throughout the season? Do you recommend compost over fertilizer or do you like to use a combination of both? And then some were just, I think there was a question about fertilizer um, of citrus trees in gram, what's best to use and when? Okay, for your temperate trees, and those would be trees that have a period of dormancy. So that would be peach, apple, pear, plum, grape, any of the fruitings that go dormant. Um, you can uh, feed them um, very early. It's called the sweetheart schedule. And you want to feed them in at uh, Valentine's, Mother's Day, and Father's Day. And so uh, anything that is, uh, oh, and, oh, and uh, anyway, on the tropicals, the ones that uh, are growing all the time and in, in don't have a dormant period, you want to feed those after the last frost. So that's usually going to be late March, early April, and then you'll feed them again around, uh, well, depending on what your fertilizer tells you to, to feed it, because uh, most of those are in pots. I use compost because uh, compost is a slow release uh, food. Uh, microbes feed on it, and those microbes are what feeds your roots of your trees. And so I prefer that. Um, occasionally, like every few years, I'll put uh, just nitrogen down, a 2100, and I will feed it lightly, and I will do that in the spring. But uh, for the rest of the time, it's just uh, compost because uh, I like it's, it, you know, really the way you want to feed your tree is you want to let your soil feed your tree. And you can help that by feeding your soil and you feed your soil by using a good compost. Okay, then there was um, a question about banana trees. Do banana plants need full sun in the winter? 
I have a section between our house that gets full sun most of the year, but not in December to January, south facing side of the house. Okay, December and January, your uh, banana trees are going to be dead. So, no, they don't need any sunlight. Uh, they will need sunlight after that. Um, banana trees just stop growing at around 57 degrees. They they just don't do cold weather. And although they may, um, you know, just stand there uh, while it gets colder and colder, they're really not, uh, they're just on hold. And so uh, you can just cut them down and forget about them. Now, if you want fruit, you have to keep enough of that trunk alive in order that it will uh, continue growing and, and not start over with pulps, with pups. So um, it is a good idea that if you're intent upon having fruit, then you need to insulate that pseudo stem uh, prior to the cold weather coming in. So someone asked about loquat trees mm -hmm. and also another person, they just said, are you going to talk about loquat trees? Well, I'll give you a quickie on loquat. Loquats are Japanese plums. They're very nice. The big problem we have with loquat, um, number one, is that uh, they can get fire blight. And so you have to make sure you try to get a variety that is resistant to it. Number two, loquat trees are blooming right now. So uh, a problem we'll have with getting fruit will be a hard freeze or a late freeze like one in uh, March when the fruit is just beginning to ripen up. So that's the problem with uh, not just loquats, but also apricots. Apricots will do the same thing. And uh, it's just that there's, they bear so early in the year that uh, we often lose that fruit through uh, freezes and frost. Loquats, uh, there are a number of uh, name varieties in the market and some uh, like the golden nugget is a replacement for the apricot and uh, others have a little more tang to them uh, and less sweetness. So it just depends on what you're looking for, but they're an easy uh, and tropical looking plum tree. Could you talk about jujube and Asian pears? I'm in Lakeway, Austin, and have had success with persimmons figs, but I've been struggling to keep my jujube alive. My Asian pears are doing well, but still only one fruit or no fruits, although they've been in my garden for three to five years. Okay, um, Asian pears are going to need a pollinator. Jujube needs more soil than you have. Um, jujubes need a uh, deep soil. And in your area, I think you are doing good to have maybe 12 to 18 inches of soil. And um, they're going to need more. So uh, jujube probably is not your best pick for the Austin uh, area. Is that it? Yeah, I guess. Um, then I have things like I have a mango in a pot. It is probably eight years old and never produced fruit. The leaves are beautiful. The tree is supposed to be a small tree. Uh huh. Well, so. uh, has she tried uh, hand pollinating? That's there's no real question. I guess it's just there's no fruit on it. Well, if it's blooming, then she should try uh, hand pollinating. That would uh, that would help. Okay. Or she needs a pollinator. She's going to need. I mean, it, if she has it outside, she probably has insects visit. But if she has it on a porch or something like that, she may not be getting uh, sufficient uh, pollinators. Okay. Can dragon fruit survive winter in our area? And that answer is no. <laughs> no. Do you have any recommendation for getting a dewberry bush to thrive? Yes, put it where you don't want it. 
and there will be absolutely no problems. Uh, dewberries do great. They come up like crazy. You just um, give them a space to let them uh, grow. You can go and, you know, get some young ones from the side of the road and put them in good soil and then don't baby them too much. Okay. Um, where was it? Can you grow pomegranate in this area? And what would be the issues? Cold, pests, et cetera. Well, no, pomegranates grow quite well here. In fact, um, most of our pomegranates did not even die during uh, Uri. The problem we have, we can grow pomegranates, but they're just not very pretty. And that reason is because we have a lot of humidity and our humidity um, causes our, um, will cause our trees to have heart rot, um, cause a lot of sunburn, uh, they're spotted. They're just, they don't look good, but uh, generally they're pretty good once you get them open. Maybe ask if anyone has any questions they could open up. Oh, do avocados need a lot of fertilizer? No, they do not need a lot of fertilizer. What they need is a good fertilizer. And you should probably, um, if it's in a pot, you want to use a time release fertilizer and then, you know, follow the direction. Some of them you uh, put in every six months, some you put in every three months. So it would depend on, on what you've purchased. But if you have it in the ground, again, you want to fertilize it, uh, it around late March, early April, and then uh, once again in, in uh, around June. What's the best soil to use in containers for citrus trees, lemons and limes? Well, uh, the best soil for a container pot is a uh, potting mixture with no, um, no soil enhancers, nothing like that. You just want a sterile potting mix because what you want in a, in a pot is just a growing medium. And so you don't have to go and buy anything really fancy at all. You just need a growing medium. You can put it in and then uh, you add your fertilizer, which is uh, a citrus fertilizer, has a little more uh, uh, acidity in it. Um, I just got a question because I missed it is um, for dragon fruit. Someone asked about hand pollinating it. Absolutely. Um, you know, they're pollinated by this dead gum moth that flies around at night. And um, I never got enough. I never got those moths for some reason. So, yes, you do have to hand pollinate it. And so you use a little paintbrush and you just make sure that you get the pollen down in there. And if you have only one um if you have only one flower bloom, you can actually knock that pollen into like an envelope or a little plastic jar and save it until you have another flower open and then you can that you can pollinate. What fertilizer would you recommend for dragon fruit? I gosh. Let me see what I give it Osmocote. I use Osmocote, you can use carpool, uh, coral, pool. It also has the same formulation, but um, I don't fertilize heavily the uh, dragon fruit. I rarely fertilize my cactus. So it's not something that you uh, need to spend a lot of time worrying about. Um, Is that it? Yeah, I think that's about it. Well, excellent. I'm, uh, I'm really glad you joined us today. I hope uh, I got um, a lot of information out to you and um, thank you very much for, for coming. Thank you so much for coming. Um, be sure to register for our next um, event on, I, sorry. Next event on November, oh, I didn't put the date, but anyway, you can definitely register for that at the link that I posted. It's in November and it'll be at 2 p.m. 
and I will go ahead and stop recording. And I thank you, Deborah, for a great presentation. Uh, it was our honor to have you. Thank, thank you so much. Everybody. Yeah, thank you, Nancy. Thank you, all the Master Gardeners. Thank you, Boone. Uh, and we'll see you next time. It'll be November 16th, Tree Care Basics. Fantastic.